Sales are our backbone, our lifeblood. Sales make Radio Shack profitable. We have a system no one else can match, backed by over 60 years of experience. A commitment to our customer that Radio Shack will provide quality products, service, and dedicated professional sales makers like yourself. Welcome to Advanced Retail Selling Skills. This segment deals with the third stage of selling, qualifying the customer. This program will show you how to ask questions to uncover your customer's needs, enabling you to close more sales. We've given you the professional tools to be a successful salesmaker in the basic retail selling skills program. Be familiar with and master these basic skills on the sales floor. First, master the fundamentals. Then use this program to polish and expand your skills to close more sales. This advanced program will help you build your career as a professional salesmaker if you listen, learn, and practice the skills presented in this program. Put this learning to work every day. Let's begin by positioning qualifying within Radio Shack's 14 steps to selling. Step one, the preparation. Step two, the approach. Step three, the greeting. Step four, the warm-up. Step five, the qualification. Step six, the presentation demonstration. Step seven, merchandise motivation. Step eight, Radio Shack's benefits. Step nine, the trial close. Step 10, overcoming objections. Step 11, the close. Step 12, the turnover. Step 13, the final close. And step 14, the follow-up. Step one, the preparation, getting ready to sell. Is your store ready, clean, well displayed, and your display items stocked with batteries, tapes, and everything necessary for customer demonstrations? Be prepared, both mentally and physically. Dress the part of a success. Wear your name tag with pride. Ensure that your store is ready for the customer. Do you know your products and your ads? Know your product line, the features and benefits. Know which newspaper ads and flyers are circulating at all times. Have your ticket book, current pocket price book, current catalogs, flyers, and a pen available at all times. Do you have a supply of battery cards? These cards encourage your customers to come back to your store as repeat customers. Remember, 73% of our business is repeat business. Are you prepared mentally? Do you have a positive mental attitude? Are you proud of yourself, your store, and your company? Step two, the approach. If you are prepared, your customer's first impressions are going to be positive. Before they even enter the door, they'll see a clean store with neat signage, an appealing window display, and a neatly dressed salesmaker. First impressions do count. Sell yourself before you sell the merchandise. People buy from people they like. Smile, be friendly. Your goal is to make your customers feel that they are important. Step three, the greeting. Smile. Look directly into the customer's eyes as you begin your greeting. Hello, welcome to Radio Shack. Introduce yourself and extend your hand for a handshake. Refrain from saying, may I help you? This invites a negative response from the customer. Use a merchandise approach or something else you're comfortable with. Step four, the warm-up. Showing interest, smiling, and listening are fundamental in building trust and rapport with the customer. One of the most important skills in building this bond is listening. When you listen to your customers, you make them feel important. That helps them relax. Good salesmakers are good listeners. Remember to maintain eye contact, but do not stare. Use the customer's name throughout your presentation. You might feel more comfortable taking notes, but first, Ask the customer if it's okay to take notes. No one can remember everything the customer is saying. Watch the customer's body language and look for buying signals. Now let's proceed to the main topic of this program,
qualifying the customer. Can you determine what the customer is saying? What the customer wants? This program will deal with the following. A definition of qualification. Are you asking the right questions? Different types of questions to ask. Situations to discuss. And a summary of qualification. The qualification step gives you the opportunity to present your product in direct response to the customer's individual needs and desires. This step of the sales process is often ignored as salesmakers fail to find out what the customer's true needs are. Due to this, a lot of sales are lost or unnecessary returns are generated by customers who really did not want the merchandise. By selling to the customer's needs and desires, you can present the ideal product with the features and benefits that the customer wants. You will close the sale, the customer will be satisfied, and the company will profit. Remember, our definition of a professional salesmaker is a person who sells products that don't come back to customers who do. Uncover what the customer wants and expects the merchandise to do. Learn as much as possible about your customer's needs and wants so you can use this information in presenting the product that has the particular features to satisfy their needs. Your job is to sell what your customer wants to buy, not what you want. Always look at the product through the customer's eyes, not yours. Let me give you an example of what I mean. A number of years ago, four outstanding salespeople were presented with national awards. One of the salespeople who had earned this award was a man who at the time earned $20,000 a year selling real estate. Obviously, even back then, there were an awful lot of salespeople who were doing a whole lot better than that. Why did this particular man get a national award? The answer is fascinating. The salesperson was totally blind. Never in his lifetime had he seen any of the homes he sold. When he was interviewed, the first question asked was, tell us, with your handicap, the man stopped the interviewer and replied, I have no handicap. I have an advantage over every other salesperson. I have no eyes of my own. The only way I can see a product is through my customer's eyes. The capacity to see the merchandise through the customer's eyes so you can sell them what they want to buy. This is a piece of information we have to gain in qualification. What do they really want to buy? A profile of a highly successful salesmaker would include an individual who asks a lot of questions and listens. Let's listen in on a sales interview that's taking place in one of our Radio Shack stores. Hello, I'm David Gunn. Welcome to Radio Shack. Hello, David. Sally Osborne, glad to meet you. Do you own a cellular phone? My husband does, but I don't. Well, what do you and your husband like most about your cellular phone? John, my husband, uses it to make business calls going to and from work. I drive alone at night a lot, so I like the idea that if I get stuck somewhere, I can call for help from my car. I like to keep in touch with my family. I'm constantly borrowing my husband's car because of the phone, so that's why we're interested in getting a phone for my car. That's right. This cellular phone offers you the ultimate security device. If you have a breakdown or get stuck in traffic, you can call for help. Wouldn't that offer you peace of mind? Definitely. In choosing a new phone, what would you alter or improve? I'd get a portable model. John's is glued to his car so you can't take it anywhere. I'd love to be able to take it on our boat to picnics, vacation, and camping. I'm a Girl Scout leader and we go overnight camping a lot. Well, where do you usually go camping? Just west of here in the mountains. And boating? Mountain Lake. That's great. Our transportable cellular phone will give you what you're looking for. Here, let me show you. It quickly converts from a mobile to a portable unit. It can be carried anywhere within the cellular service area. And from what you just told me, you boat and camp within the service areas. So you have to be within this area to use the phone. Uh, that's correct. What if we're on our boat? As long as you're in the cellular service area, you're okay. But if you go out of the area, then the phone will not work. <laughs> so don't take it on an ocean voyage. <laughs> right. This system will allow you peace of mind while on camping trips. If there's an emergency, 
You have easy access to doctors and hospitals. It operates like an ordinary phone. If we're camping, how does it stay charged? It charges through this battery pack and gives you 30 to 60 minutes of continuous talk or 10 to 12 hours of standby. Or you can plug it into your cigarette lighter and run it off the battery in your vehicle. Is it easy to use? It operates like an ordinary phone. Let you see the number dialed before the call is placed. Isn't that convenient? It sure is. Here, why don't you make a call? Just punch the number in and hit send. I think I'll call John. <laughs> okay. Good morning, John Osborne's office. Hi, Jane. Is he in? No, he's on his way south to visit a client. Okay, thanks. Can I try to reach him on his cellular phone? Sure. Hello? Hi, hon. You'll never guess where I am. I have no idea. I'm at Radio Shack talking to you on one of their cellular phones. You sound great. How do I sound? Clear as a bell. What time will you be home? About six. Okay. See you later. Bye. Wasn't that easy to use? Yes, it was. How quickly are you planning to invest in a new phone? Before our next camping trip, but I want to make sure that this one fits my needs. Well, let me show you some more features. It provides one-touch redial of the last number you called if it was busy or unanswered. It even stores up to 98 local or long-distance numbers for fast two-digit dialing. This feature allows you to enter only a two-digit code for safer driving while dialing. The keys and controls are illuminated for easier, safer operation under low light conditions and while driving at night. Sure would be useful while camping in the woods at night, wouldn't it? Yes, definitely. The electronic lock prevents unauthorized phone use. You control the use of your transportable phone. We have an optional horn alert kit, which can even inform you of an incoming call by sounding your horn or lighting your headlamps when you're out of your vehicle. And an optional hands-free kit that allows you to operate your phone hands-free. Are you familiar with a speakerphone? Yes. Well, this operates like a speakerphone. The microphone clips on your sun visor, allowing you hands-free operation to drive your car with two hands instead of tying up one hand with a phone. Isn't that a safety feature you'd like? Yes. Who will be doing the installation? Not my husband. He's all thumbs. We had our other system installed professionally. Well, for an additional cost, Radio Shack can install your system. But this system has been designed for easy installation. The transceiver unit can be mounted in your trunk to stay out of your way and easily removed for portable operation. It has a built-in handle for transportable use. The compact handset and speaker interface mount up front on the floor or dash. Three easy-to-install mobile antennas are available. Our magnetic antenna can be removed. You can even take your transportable cellular phone on vacation with you and use it in a rental car. Now, wouldn't that be convenient? Boy, that's great. Does it make coffee in the morning, too? <laughs> <laughs> now, Our salesmaker asked questions to gain valuable information that he used to present the product with the features the customer needs and wants. Are you asking the right kinds of questions? Have you been able to gain valuable information that can help you close sales by asking questions? Of course, questions help determine your customer's needs and wants. Learn, study, and practice our questioning techniques so that you can close more qualified sales. I'm now going to explain a step-by-step -step method of qualification that will help you with your customers. Remember, qualification is the key to high production. Now for the strategy. There are three basic steps that can increase your sales performance. Step one, find out what they have now. Do you own a cellular phone? My husband does, but I don't. Are you looking for an additional TV, or are you planning to replace one? I'm looking for a TV for my bedroom. Now what do you have now? A quasar. What other questions can you ask to find out what they have now? Did you think of these? Have you found the product with the features you want? Are you looking for a gift or something for yourself? 
By knowing what they have now, you can get a better idea of what kind of person they are and what their needs are going to be. When you know where they're headed, you know how to sell them what they need to get there. You'll need to develop lines of questioning that are capable of digging out the facts you need. Give this as much thought and practice as you can. Qualifying is too important to allow some difficulty here to stop you. Step two, find out what they like most about the product they have now. Well, what do you and your husband like most about your cellular phone? Well, John, that's my husband. He uses it to make business calls when he's traveling to and from work. I have to drive alone at night quite a bit, so... What do you like most about your Quasar? It didn't cost an arm and a leg, and it lasted a long time. Well, cost is important. You want a set that's a good value for your money and that will last. Isn't that correct? That's right. Well, I have a set here I think you'd like. Can you think of additional questions to ask to find out what your customers like most about the products they have? I hope you came up with a few more questions. Knowing how they feel about what they have points you straight at how to make the sale. You want to present the product that will key into the specific features or benefits that the customer likes and wants most. Step three, what would you like to see altered or improved in your new product? In choosing a new phone, what would you alter or improve? I'd get a portable model. John's is glued to his car so you can't take it anywhere. I'd love to do In choosing a new TV, what would you change? I'd like a TV with remote control. I have to constantly get up to change a channel, and I'm afraid to admit it, but I get a little lazy sometimes. I work hard all day and want to relax at home. So a remote control is important to you, isn't it? Very important. We have one here I think you may like. Can you think of additional questions to ask? A professional salesmaker uses the answers to this question to find out which features he must emphasize to close the sale. Build your demonstration and product presentation around the things the customer wants altered or changed in what they have now. Only show the customer products that have the features they truly desire. This is critical information for selecting which product you'll present and which features you'll emphasize in your presentation. When you feed back what the customer has told you he wants, he has to agree that you're making sense. Complete knowledge of your product line is essential. You cannot present products that meet customer needs and wants unless you know your products, the features, and the benefits. Are you beginning to understand the importance of questioning and how much information can be conveyed through questioning? If you follow these three steps and concentrate on working with the customer, you can help them enjoy the benefits that they want. You'll be working with customers who've pre-committed themselves to what you have. They will literally be sold before you present the merchandise. Your presentation will simply be a confirmation that they've got to have it. Can you feel how excited and fulfilled you'll be closing in these types of situations? The correct way to sell is also the easy way once you learn how to organize yourself to do it. The entire concept of qualifying the customer is based on the premise that you are a professional. You know which product has the particular features to satisfy your customer's needs. Without your professional assistance, the customer will waste time, money, and will still not end up with what they need and want. Good qualifying helps the customer as well as the salesmaker. Different types of questions to ask. Your first contact with a customer might be a qualifying question, such as, are you looking for an additional system or are you replacing a current one? This question is an approach, a greeting, and an excellent qualifying question. Additional questions which encourage customers to talk about their needs are, do you have some particular features in mind? Have you found the system with the features you want? What features do you want your new system to have? Stimulate your customers to talk and then encourage them to give you more information.
The more information you have, the better equipped you'll be to present the product that they truly want and need. Open and closed questions. Ask open versus closed questions. An open question does not elicit a yes or no response. It encourages the customer to reply with a statement. A closed question can only be answered with a yes or no. See if you can tell the difference. May I help you? No. Do you like the new CDs? Yes. Do you own a VCR? No. Do you like music? Yes. What type of system do you presently have? What do you like about your VCR? What features would you want on your new machine? Where will you be placing your new system? When do you need the TV? What's the most important thing to you about having a new TV? Were you able to distinguish between the open and closed questions? Closed questions usually begin with, do you? Questions that begin with who, what, where, when, and how are open questions and force the customer to respond with information that's needed to determine wants and needs. Who will be using the product? I want to buy stereo for my son. He finally passed algebra. Now, who uses your present system the most in your home? My son. He has the stereo on constantly. What Radio Shack products do you already own? Well, we bought an antenna last year. It was a good buy. What's the most important thing to you about having a new stereo? Quality and price. Where will you be using this TV? Well, this is a gift for my aunt. I guess she'll be putting it in her den. Where did you see the advertisement for this video recorder? In the newspaper. When is your aunt's birthday? Tomorrow. I've almost waited too long. When are you planning your trip? We're leaving in two weeks. I'd really like a phone by then. How do you normally handle this type of purchase, by cash or charge? I'll charge it. How familiar are you with the cellular phone? Very familiar. My husband has one. Can you see how easy it is to ask questions that make the customer respond with information that you need? Ask questions, then listen to your customer's response. Practice the five W's. Who, what, where, when, and how. Selling is the art of asking the right questions to get the minor yeses that allow you to lead your customer to the major decision and the major yes. Selling is basically a simple function, and the final sale is nothing more than the sum total of all your yeses. Isn't that right? Of course it is. <laughs> lead your customer to positive responses. Use a tie-down question. Tie-down questions usually begin or end with the following. Aren't they? Can't you? Could it? Doesn't it? Don't you agree? Don't we? Shouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Haven't they? Hasn't she? Isn't it? Isn't that right? Didn't it? Won't they? Won't you? The skillful asking of questions it's the best way to raise your customer response potential. Most sales are the result of a series of small commitments rather than one big yes. You can improve your customer response level by asking questions. Allow your customers the time to respond. Wouldn't it be nice to just sit back and change channels instead of jumping up and down? Yes. Isn't it easy to operate? Sure is. Doesn't it have a terrific sound? Yeah, it sounds great. Are you beginning to understand the importance of qualifying and questioning, and how much information can be conveyed through questioning? Yes. Don't you feel that you can improve your questioning techniques and close more sales? Yes. Well, let's see if you absorb the information in this program. You'll be viewing selling scenes and you'll be asked to comment on the sales presentation used. You might want to take some notes, so we'll take a short pause so you can get ready.
Hi, I'm David Gunn. Welcome to Radio Shack. Uh, the Cellupone 200 transportable cellular telephone lets you make and take calls just as you would with a regular push-button phone. But you can use it at times when you would normally be out of contact, when you're stuck in a traffic jam, making a delivery, or out of your vehicle. It's designed so you can install it yourself but, uh, and transfers easily from your personal car. So you or a family member will never have to drive alone again. And the many advantages you'll enjoy with the Cellupone 200... I just came in to use the bathroom. <laughs> This salesmaker was definitely talking too much. He did not let the customer talk, and he did not ask questions to qualify the customer. Salesmakers who insist on dominating a conversation rarely hear what the other person has to say. If the salesmaker would only learn to shut up and listen, the customer will invariably tell what his problems are and give clues on how to sell to him. Don't feel threatened by silence. Wait for an answer after asking a question. Too often, after a question is asked and a customer pauses to reflect, the salesmaker can't stand the silence, so he either answers his own question or asks another one right away. You've got to let the customer talk. Let him tell you what's on his mind. Let's watch another scene and see how the salesmaker handles this customer. Hello, welcome to Radio Shack. I'm David Gunn. I'm interested in a telephone for my daughter. She just turned 16 and is on the phone constantly, and I thought it would be a good idea to get her own phone. Well, what kind? I don't believe the kid. She comes home from school at 2.30 and doesn't get off the phone until her mother starts screaming about dinner, and then after dinner she's back at it again. I well, have no idea what they're talking about. What kind of... Maybe I'll get all the phones disconnected in the house. That would teach her a lesson, but then I wouldn't get any calls. I don't know what I'll do. This is just the reverse scene where the salesmaker cannot get a word in to ask questions. How would you handle this customer? That's right. Listen to the customer and present the product that has the features and benefits he or she wants. Let's once again look at a good sales interview illustrating all the techniques that we've demonstrated in this advanced selling skills tape on qualifying the customer. See if you can identify the steps and techniques being demonstrated. Hello, I'm David Gunn. Welcome to Radio Shack. Hello, David. Sally Osborne, glad to meet you. Do you own a cellular phone? My husband does, but I don't. Well, what do you and your husband like most about your cellular phone? John, my husband, uses it to make business calls going to and from work. I drive alone at night a lot, so I like the idea that if I get stuck somewhere, I can call for help from my car. I like to keep in touch with my family. I'm constantly borrowing my husband's car because of the phone, so that's why we're interested in getting a phone for my car. That's right. The cellular phone offers you the ultimate security device. If you have a breakdown or get stuck in traffic, you can call for help. Wouldn't that offer you peace of mind? Definitely. In choosing a new phone, what would you alter or improve? I'd get a portable model. John's is glued to his car so you can't take it anywhere. I'd love to be able to take it on our boat to picnics, vacation, and camping. I'm a Girl Scout leader and we go overnight camping a lot. Well, where do you usually go camping? Just west of here in the mountains. And boating? Mountain Lake. That's great. Our transportable cellular phone will give you what you're looking for. Here, let me show you. It quickly converts from a mobile to a portable unit. It can be carried anywhere within the cellular service area. And from what you just told me, you boat and camp within the service areas. So you have to be within this area to use the phone. Uh, that's correct. What if we're on our boat? As long as you're in the cellular service area, you're okay. But if you go out of the area, then the phone will not work. <laughs> so don't take it on an ocean voyage. <laughs> right. This system will allow you peace of mind while on camping trips. If there's an emergency, you have easy access to doctors and hospitals. It operates like an ordinary phone. If we're camping, how does it stay charged? It charges through this battery pack and gives you 30 to 60 minutes of continuous talk or 10 to 12 hours of standby. 
Or you can plug it into your cigarette lighter and run it off the battery in your vehicle. Is it easy to use? It operates like an ordinary phone. Let you see the number dialed before the call is placed. Isn't that convenient? It sure is. Here, why don't you make a call? Just punch the number in and hit send. I think I'll call John. <laughs> okay. Good morning, John Osborne's office. Hi, Jane. Is he in? No, he's on his way south to visit a client. Okay, thanks. Can I try to reach him on his cellular phone? Sure. Hello? Hi, hon. You'll never guess where I am. I have no idea. I'm at Radio Shack talking to you on one of their cellular phones. You sound great. How do I sound? Clear as a bell. What time will you be home? About six. Okay. See you later. Bye. Wasn't that easy to use? Yes, it was. How quickly are you planning to invest in a new phone? Before our next camping trip, but I want to make sure that this one fits my needs. Well, let me show you some more features. It provides one-touch redial of the last number you call if it was busy or unanswered. It even stores up to 98 local or long-distance numbers for fast two-digit dialing. This feature allows you to enter only a two-digit code for safer driving while dialing. The keys and controls are illuminated for easier, safer operation under low-light conditions and while driving at night. Sure would be useful while camping in the woods at night, wouldn't it? Yes, definitely. The electronic lock prevents unauthorized phone use. You control the use of your transportable phone. We have an optional horn alert kit, which can even inform you of an incoming call by sounding your horn or lighting your headlamps when you're out of your vehicle. And an optional hands-free kit that allows you to operate your phone hands-free. Are you familiar with a speakerphone? Yes. Well, this operates like a speakerphone. The microphone clips on your sun visor, allowing you hands-free operation to drive your car with two hands instead of tying up one hand with a phone. Isn't that a safety feature you'd like? Yes. Who will be doing the installation? Not my husband. He's all thumbs. We had our other system installed professionally. Well, for an additional cost, Radio Shack can install your system. But this system has been designed for easy installation. The transceiver unit can be mounted in your trunk to stay out of your way and easily removed for portable operation. It has a built-in handle for transportable use. The compact handset and speaker interface mount up front on the floor or dash. Three easy-to-install mobile antennas are available. Our magnetic antenna can be removed. You can even take your transportable cellular phone on vacation with you and use it in a rental car. Now, wouldn't that be convenient? Boy, that's great. Does it make coffee in the morning, too? <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> See how easy it is to ask questions to identify your customers' needs and wants? Salesmakers are not born. They are created. Every major big-time salesmaker has been a learned salesmaker. The kind of person who takes information, such as the material we've discussed in this program, and makes that information a part of himself or herself. Because with this skill, you'll be on your way to becoming a professional salesmaker who closes more sales in your store, in your district, region, and in the entire organization. You've been given tactics with which you can win, and that's your job, to win sales. So we wish you the skill to win. We wish you greatness. Video products, especially TVs and VCRs, represent one of today's most competitive markets. And although Radio Shack's dedication to excellence at every stage of product development has made our video components second to none, that alone is not enough. We are counting on you, Radio Shack's professional sales maker, to master basic selling skills and specific product knowledge and to make Radio Shack the place to buy video. So, let's get started. You've already learned the Radio Shack way to sell from our basic retail selling skills tape and have started practicing the fundamentals of preparation, greeting, qualification, demonstration and presentation, closing, 
and follow-up. This tape is designed to help you turn those basic skills into big-ticket video sales. To sell video products effectively, you need to know two things, how they work and how they are used. Information about how a product works, such as press this button to record and this one to play back, is important during the demonstration and presentation portion of the sale. Information about how a product is used, such as the NTS decoder lets you record the new stereo broadcasts, helps you match the customer's needs with specific products and product features during the qualification portion of the sale. Now, this type of information is also useful when overcoming objections after the trial close. In this tape, we provide both types of information. Chapter 2, Video Basics, explains terms and features that are common to TVs, VCRs, and most other video products. But don't worry, we aren't going to bombard you with confusing technical jargon. Everything is explained in simple language that both you and the customer can easily understand. Chapter 3, VCRs, and Chapter 4, TVs, contain specific information about the most common video products. We want you to be familiar with the basic operation of every TV and VCR feature available because these two products form the nucleus of all home video systems. And we want you to know how each feature is used so you can help the customer choose the products that best meet their needs. We suggest that you watch the tape from beginning to end the first time, then occasionally review the chapter or chapters that contain information that you need most. In this chapter, we discuss things that are common to most video products. And because all video products must be connected to some type of video signal, we begin the chapter with a discussion of the two types of video signals, radio frequency and baseband. Radio frequency, often referred to as RF, is the general name for all signals used for broadcast and cable TV. RF includes VHF antenna signals, UHF antenna signals, and cable signals. The common characteristic of all RF video signals is that the picture and sound portions of the signal travel together either through the air or through the cable wire. Here's how that works. At the TV station or cable company, the picture and sound are loaded onto the radio frequency signal for a particular channel. This loading process is called modulation, and the RF signal for the particular channel is called the carrier. The RF carrier travels through the air or through the cable wire to your TV where the picture and sound are unloaded. In a TV, the picture goes to the picture tube and the sound goes to the speaker. This unloading process is called demodulation. RF signals are used by TV stations and cable companies because they travel better over long distances. Baseband signals, the other type of video signals, are separate sound and picture signals that have not been loaded onto an RF signal. Baseband sound signals are commonly called audio and baseband picture signals are called video. All VCRs have input and output jacks for video and audio baseband signals. Radio Shack's combination TV monitors also have audio video jacks for baseband signals. Baseband signals are preferred when sending signals only a short distance within your video system because they are less subject to interference than RF signals and because loading or modulating the audio and video onto an RF signal always results in a slight lowering of signal quality. But now that you are a video signal expert, you might ask, how does this affect me or my customers? Here's an example. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hi. Could I show you a VCR today? No, all I really need is a short length of coaxial cable to record a tape from one VCR to another. We do have that type of cable, but you'll get a better copy if you connect the separate audio and video jacks of the VCRs. Our video dubbing kit is specially made for that purpose. Great. I didn't know you had a special video dubbing kit. Sure do. Here, I'll show you right this way. Thanks. Did you notice that the salesmaker in our example didn't use any technical terms? It's important to know the technical terms for the signals so that you are ready for customers who are technical types. But don't use technical terms unless the customer uses them first. Match your explanations to the customer's level of understanding. For most customers, keep it simple is the rule.
The different types of video signals are directly related to the different types of video cable. So we will discuss cables next. In a home video system, radio frequency signals from an antenna or cable system are carried by either coaxial cable or flat lead. The most obvious differences in the two are their shape. Coaxial cable is round, and as the name implies, flat lead is flat. But there are more important differences. The impedance of flat lead is always 300 ohms. Coaxial cable used for TV signals has an impedance of 75 ohms. It's not important for you to understand exactly what impedance is, but you should know that the impedance of the cable must match the impedance of the unit it is connected to. We'll talk more about this later. Other differences between the two types of RF cable are coaxial is less susceptible to interference than flat lead. Coaxial cable causes less signal loss than flat lead when the signal must be sent long distances. Coaxial cable lasts longer than flat lead. And coaxial cable accessories, such as splitters, cause less signal loss than flat lead accessories. If you're getting the idea that coaxial cable is better for transmitting RF signals than flat lead, you're right. You should point out the benefits of coaxial cable to all customers and encourage them to use it in new installations. I need 100 feet of lead-in wire for my new TV antenna. What do you recommend? Well, we recommend coaxial cable for many reasons. Um, signal loss, it, it lasts longer. Also, encourage the customer to replace worn-out flat lead with coaxial cable in existing installations. A few people will insist on using flat lead in spite of the benefits of coaxial cable. And Radio Shack will continue to carry top quality flat lead and 300 ohm accessories as long as the demand is sufficient. Finally, before we leave our discussion of RF cable, you should know that all coaxial cable is not the same. Only RG59 and RG6 coaxial cable should be used for video signals. And of those two types, RG6 is preferred. All Radio Shack pre-made coaxial cables are RG6. We mentioned earlier that the impedance of the cable must match the impedance of the unit it is connected to. But all TV antennas have an impedance of 300 ohms. And some TVs have only the older type 300 ohm screw terminals for antenna connections. How can the customer use the recommended 75 ohm coaxial cable with these units? Matching transformers are the answer. A special mast-mounted matching transformer is used to make the connection to the antenna. And a similar indoor-outdoor matching transformer is used to make the connection to the TV. Radio Shack has many specialized matching transformers for other purposes. Another common name for the matching transformer is Ballon. But you should call it a matching transformer when talking to customers because that name is more descriptive of what the unit does. Radio Shack signal splitters are another type of matching transformers. But in addition to matching the impedance of the cable to the impedance of the TV or VCR, they also divide the signals from an antenna into VHF and UHF signals. Some signal splitters also provide a connection for FM radios. Signal splitters are necessary whenever a combination VHF-UHF antenna is used. And although all of our combination antennas come with a signal splitter, there is no guarantee that the splitter outputs will match the customer's components. Now, is the VHF antenna connection on your TV the type that has two separate screws or the type with a single large screw-on connector? Gosh, I'm really not sure. Does it make a difference? Uh, yes, it makes a large difference. Uh, now, this type of splitter here is the most common. Uh, we'll get you one of these, and if that doesn't do the job well, we'll be happy to exchange it for you. Notice again that the salesmaker didn't use technical terms, but rather described the difference between 300 and 75 ohm connectors in simple terms. Also, did you notice that the salesmaker only asked about the type of terminals used for the VHF connection? That's because UHF connections are almost always 300 ohm. It's the VHF connection that varies. In any case, the wide selection of matching transformers and signal splitters Radio Shack offers should allow you to suggest a single transformer for a connection that needs one. Use of more than one splitter or transformer for a single connection causes unnecessary weakening of the TV signal, not to mention causing an eyesore. All the cables and accessories we've talked about so far are for RF video signals, either VHF, UHF, or cable. 
A different type of cable and connector are necessary for separate video and audio, or baseband signals. The cable is called shielded video cable, and the connectors are called RCA type. The most important thing to know about these cables is that they are not the same as hi-fi patch cords. They are similar in appearance, but the cable inside is different. Because video signals use much higher frequencies than hi-fi signals, the cables must have more shielding. Typical hi-fi cable has 40% shielding, which is sufficient for hi-fi. But all Radio Shack video cables use 100% shielded RG6 cable, for minimum interference and signal loss at video signal frequencies. I want the best cables you have for the audio video connections on my VCR. What about those gold plated ones? Well some gold plated cables are intended for hi-fi systems. Our specially designed gold plated video cables will give you great results with your VCR. The channel selector or tuner is another feature that is common to TVs and VCRs. And although all tuners do the basic job of selecting channels, there are three distinctively different types of tuners. Each type offers options and features that can be important sales tools. The first type of tuner is the mechanical or clicking tuner. This type of tuner offers good basic operation in most situations. However, its internal contacts eventually wear out or get dirty, causing poor reception. And mechanical tuners are not easily adapted to remote control operation. Remote operation of these tuners requires expensive, bulky servo motors. Because of this and the more frequent need for service, mechanical tuners are limited to low-end products. However, there are several reasons a customer might prefer a mechanical tuner TV. For example, when price is the determining factor, or when the TV will be used on a limited basis, as in a guest room. The second type of tuner is the Varactor tuner. And although you might not be familiar with the term Varactor, you've probably seen many examples of Varactor tuners. A Varactor tuner usually has a group of channel selection buttons. Each button has a separate pair of controls, a tuning wheel and a band selector that is used to program the button for a particular channel. The Varactor tuner is more durable than the mechanical tuner and is easy to operate once the buttons are programmed. However, the number of channels that can be programmed at one time is limited by the number of channel buttons the tuner has. 12 to 16 button is normal. The voltage synthesized tuner is another type of Varactor tuner. But instead of using tuning wheels to program the channel buttons, up-down tuning buttons are used to select channels to store in electronic memory positions. This type of tuner offers digital display of the selected channel and allows programming of more channels than the other type of Varactor tuner. 40 or more memory positions is common. Both types of Varactor tuners are usually cable ready. We will talk later about what cable ready really means. Also, either type of Varactor tuner is more easily adapted to remote control than mechanical tuners. The remote control is limited to scanning through the program channel in the sequence they are programmed, however. The digital PLL tuner, or frequency synthesized tuner, is the third type. It is the current state of the art in tuners, and it is common for these tuners to provide access to a hundred or more channels. Because of their PLL, or phased lock loop circuitry, and the absence of moving parts, these tuners are very dependable. But it is their ease and flexibility of operation that have made them so popular. Digital PLL tuners allow complete access to all channels at all times. You don't have to pick 12 or 16 channels and forget about the rest, or go through a complicated reprogramming procedure to watch something new. This is especially important in metropolitan areas that have a large number of stations, or with cable systems that offer 60 or more channels. And the digital PLL tuner is perfect for remote control. Most offer both channel scanning and direct channel access from the remote control. When scanning, up-down buttons are used to step through the channels in either direction. Often, the tuner has a scanning memory that can be programmed to select only your favorite channels during scanning. Direct selection allows selection of any channel, whether or not it is in the scanning memory. The remote control has a 10-key number pad, and you simply enter the channel number to go directly to the desired channel. 
The tuner might not always be the deciding factor in a sale, but explain the differences to all customers so they can decide what they need and want. Which TV can I show you today? This one has a sharp picture. Mm -hmm. What about it? Yes, as a matter of fact, all of our TVs have the new high contrast screen. Do you subscribe to our local cable system? Yes, I do. Well, in that case, this TV here has a digital tuner that will allow you remote control selection of all the non-scrambled channels. Mm. I'm not sure if I need that. What other differences are there? Maybe the customer will choose the digital tuner model TV. Maybe not. But she did sound interested, didn't she? The important thing is that the salesmaker introduced the step-up model without being negative about the low-end unit. Multi-Channel Television Sound, or MTS, is the official name for the new stereo TV broadcast system, and it can be a strong selling feature. But before we talk about selling, let's talk about how MTS works. The MTS signal contains stereo information added to the regular broadcast audio signal. Using the same illustration we used earlier to explain RF signals, the MTS information is like a trailer added to the audio portion of the signal. But MTS is more than just stereo. There is a third audio channel called Special Audio Program, or SAP. It can contain audio information totally unrelated to the TV program, such as 24-hour news and weather broadcasts. Or it can carry second language audio for the TV program. Every MTS broadcast doesn't contain an SAP signal, but the broadcaster can add it at any time. Reception of the MTS and SAP signals requires a tuner with an MTS decoder. The decoder can be included on any type of tuner, but because MTS is considered a high-end feature, it is usually found only on Veractor or digital PLL tuners. Under ideal conditions, the quality of MTS stereo is similar to that of FM stereo. So, now that you know how MTS and SAP work, you might ask, how do I know if the local stations in my area are broadcasting MTS signals? Well, the obvious answer is, call the local stations and ask. And if they are not broadcasting in stereo, ask when they will start. All three major commercial networks and PBS are already sending the stereo signals to their local affiliate stations. If the stations are not offering MTS to their customers, it's because they haven't upgraded their equipment for MTS. All stations will do so sooner or later, but it will be sooner only if interested TV watchers urge them to. But now, let's talk about selling MTS. A simple demonstration of stereo TV sound, whether it is an MTS broadcast or a stereo hi-fi video tape, is sure to get anyone's attention. That's the time to sell. Stereo TV sounds great, doesn't it? Are you familiar with the new stereo TV broadcasts? Not really. Are the local stations broadcasting stereo? Well, Channel 13 is now, and Channels 4 and 8 have plans to do so in the near future. What kinds of programs do you like to watch the best? Believe it or not, sports are my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, with stereo TV, you'll feel like you're at the game. Of course, stereo TV is a great addition to all types of programming, particularly those with lots of music. Well, here, let's listen to what's on the public television right now. Even if your local stations are not yet broadcasting stereo, MTS is one of the TV features of the future, and it will sell. And having an MTS tuner in one component can be used as an accessory in another component. For example, you can use the MTS tuner in a VCR to receive stereo sound if your TV has only a regular tuner. There are lots of ways to sell MTS. But you might have noticed that we have not mentioned cable TV in relation to MTS. Cable companies use a different type of stereo for their premium channels. And even if the local channels included in the cable service are broadcasting an MTS stereo, the stereo might not be passed on by the cable company. Many cable systems will have to upgrade their equipment if they want to be MTS compatible. This is not a serious problem, however, and is easy to overcome. Simply connect your antenna wire and the cable wire to the input of a high isolation AB switch, then connect the AB switch output to the TV. Select the antenna signals when watching and listening to local MTS broadcasts, and select cable signals the rest of the time.
Cable TV is a major force in today's television market. And Radio Shack offers many products that are directly or indirectly related to cable TV. For this reason, it is important for you to understand how cable TV works and how our products interact with cable TV systems. There are two basic program sources for every cable TV system, satellite channels and local TV stations. At the cable company, the audio and video portions of each program source are loaded or modulated onto one of the cable channels. Remember, we explained in part one of this chapter that cable channels are part of the general signal category called radio frequency. And RF signals carry audio and video together. If you're confused about this, we suggest you watch part one again. After the audio and video signals from satellite and local station channels are loaded onto the cable channels, all the cable channels are sent through a single wire to the homes of the cable system subscribers. It's amazing, but 60 or more cable channel signals can travel through the same wire without interfering with each other. At the subscriber's homes, a cable box or cable-ready tuner selects the channel the customers want to watch. The audio and video for the selected channel are unloaded from the cable signal and sent to the appropriate circuits in the TV or VCR. But as you might have noticed, we left out something. Trapping and scrambling. No, these aren't football plays. They are techniques cable companies use to limit reception of their channels. To prevent subscribers from receiving channels they are not paying for, some cable companies insert a device called a trap in the cable wire just before the wire enters the subscriber's house. The trap prevents one particular channel from traveling any further in the wire without affecting other channels. To restrict more than one channel, additional traps are used. Other cable companies use scrambling. They simply mix up a crucial part of the signal so that a TV or VCR can't turn the signal into a picture and sound. The cable box, provided by the cable company, has special circuits that reorganize the scrambled portion of the signal. Some cable systems use cable boxes that require internal adjustments to select the channels that can unscramble. More sophisticated cable systems, called interactive systems, send special signals through the cable wire that tell the cable box which channels to unscramble. Interactive systems usually scramble most or all of their channels, and they can alter or terminate a subscriber's service from their main office. There are a few cable systems that trap some signals and scramble others. But what about stereo in cable systems? We told you earlier that most cable systems cannot use MTS stereo for their channels. Now, we'll tell you why they can't and how they send stereo signals without using MTS. Often, the channel used by cable systems are not designed to carry as much information as broadcast signals. Therefore, the MTS stereo information is removed when the local station's audio is loaded onto the cable channel. But some cable companies offered stereo audio with their premium channels even before MTS was introduced, using a technique called simulcast. The regular audio and video are loaded onto the cable signal, as usual. Then, stereo audio for the program is loaded onto an FM stereo radio signal. Both signals are sent through the same cable wire to the subscriber's house. There, the cable wire is split, usually with a simple passive splitter, so that the signals can be connected to the TV or VCR and to an FM stereo receiver. The FM stereo frequency is determined by the cable company, and information about them must be obtained from the cable company. But now that you know the ins and outs of cable system operation, you need to know a little bit more about cable channels. You've already learned that they fall into the general category of radio frequency, but are they VHF, UHF, or neither? Cable signals are all classified as VHF. In fact, VHF broadcast channels 2 through 13 and cable channels 2 through 13 are, for all practical purposes, identical. However, the remaining cable channels are different from any other TV channels, even though they often have the same number of designations as UHF channels. Now it's time to relate all this cable system information to Radio Shack products and customers. Let's begin with Radio Shack products that have cable-ready tuners. First, none of our tuners allow customers to receive cable channels they are not paying for, and you should never suggest that they do. 
However, cable-ready tuners are great with cable systems that trap out only the channels you are not paying for. All the other channels can be received by the cable-ready tuner if the cable wire is connected directly to the TV or VCR without going through the cable box. This allows the customer to use the remote control channel selection feature of the tuner when watching cable channels. With cable systems that scramble only premium channels, the cable-ready tuner is still a good feature. A special connection which uses the cable box to receive scrambled channels and the cable-ready tuner to receive all other channels maintains a high level of remote control channel selection. However, a word of caution is necessary concerning these two uses of cable-ready tuners. Some cities and states have recently passed laws that restrict the connection of customer-owned equipment to the cable wire before the wire is connected to the cable box. Find out if these apply in your area before making any suggestions. I see that this TV has a cable-ready tuner. Will that work with our local cable system? Well, sure. Are you subscribing to any of the premium channels? Just the movie channel. Well, fine. We have a connection diagram that will show you how to make the connections with your TV, and you will have remote control selection of all cable channels. I'll go get you one. Great. That'd be helpful. The connection drawing given to the customer is a copy of one of the many video connections we have printed in the merchandising newsletter in the past few years. These drawings can be tremendous salesmakers and often take care of connection problems before they happen. Interactive cable systems that scramble most or all of their channels severely limit the effectiveness of cable-ready tuners. The connection we showed for other cable systems with scrambled channels can be used but if most of the channels must be selected using the cable box, little is gained. Radio Shack's remote control cable converter, which is actually a cable-only tuner designed as a separate unit, and our cable TV block converter, which turns a standard UHF tuner into a cable-ready tuner, can be used in similar situations. They work well with cable systems that have trapped or scrambled premium channels, but have limited use with interactive systems that scramble most or all of their channels. However, don't be hesitant about selling TVs or VCRs that have cable-ready tuners, even if your local cable system is the interactive type. Radio Shack products have many other features that make them excellent values. Perhaps you have seen advertisements for digital TVs or VCRs, but how are these units different from other TVs and VCRs? Well, in most ways, they are the same. But as with most things, we need a little background information before we get to the real answers. The VHF, UHF, and cable TV signals, which we call radio frequency, and the separate audio and video signals, which we call baseband, are all part of a larger category of signals we call analog. Analog signals can be compared to a light dimmer. The light may be switched on or off, but there's also an infinite number of variations in between. Digital signals are more like a light switch. The switch is either on or off. There's no in-between. In a digital TV, the tuner receives the analog signals as usual and separates the video and audio signals. Then the audio signals are sent to the audio amplifier and speaker, but the video signals go through an extra component called an analog to digital converter. Then, because digital signals are more simple and easier to handle, all sorts of things can be done. A single picture can be stored in memory for a perfect freeze frame effect. The picture sharpness can be dramatically improved. With a special two-channel tuner, you can even get picture-in-a-picture picture that allows you to watch two channels at the same time. But the TV picture tube is not designed to use digital signals, so after the digital signals are processed, they must be converted back to analog before they're sent to the picture tube. As with TVs, the basic operation is not changed in digital VCRs. Digital VCRs receive the same signals and record the same signals in the same manner. There is simply a digital converter and processor included that can do amazing things with the picture. VCRs have probably changed home entertainment habits more than any other single product since TV was introduced. 
It seems that there's a videotape rental store on every corner, and countless workers use VCRs to record their favorite daytime shows so they can watch them at night or on weekends. But does this mean that everybody already has a VCR and that the market is saturated? Definitely not. According to recent surveys, 60 to 65 percent of the homes in the United States do not have a VCR, and about 80 percent of VCR buyers are still first-time VCR owners. Now, this means that the new customer market is tremendous. And because people who have VCRs usually want to step up to a new model every few years, current VCR owners are an important part of the market. Radio Shack can and should control a significant part of the VCR market. The value of our products is second to none. And our product line contains everything from low-end starter VCRs to high-end VCRs with every important feature available. So, watch this chapter to learn as much as possible about VCRs. Then, use the information to sell, sell, sell. There are three VCR formats in today's home video market, 8mm, Beta, and VHS. All three perform the basic functions of recording and playing videotapes, and they all offer similar features. The most obvious difference among the formats is the size of the cassettes they use. 8mm cassettes are the smallest. They are about the same size as an audio cassette. VHS and Beta cassettes both use half-inch width tape, but VHS cassettes are larger and hold more tape than beta cassettes. This is one of the reasons that VHS cassettes have a maximum recording time of eight hours, while beta cassettes have a maximum of only five hours. But when all factors are considered, we at Radio Shack believe that the VHS format has the most to offer, and nationwide sales reports support our belief. VHS products account for over 70% of VCR sales, Beta is second with 20%, and 8mm has 5% or less. And predictions indicate that the VHS share of the market will continue to grow at the expense of Beta and 8mm. Standard features are those features that all VCRs, or at least all Radio Shack VCRs, have. It's easy to take them for granted. But if you assume that everyone knows how these features work and what they're used for, you're making a big mistake. Remember, about 80% of VCR buyers are first-time VCR owners. And although the optional features, which are discussed later, might be the attention getters, proper understanding of the standard features has a greater effect on everyday use of VCRs and on the long-term customer satisfaction. If customers seem confused or have questions, Try to find out what they know and don't know, then fill in the gaps. One of the most talked about standard features is automatic timer recording. The timer consists of a clock and some type of programmable memory that tells the VCR when to start and stop recording. Automatic timers are usually described in terms of days and events. For example, a 14-day four-event automatic timer can remember times for recording four separate programs and can be set to start recording up to two weeks from the present time. All automatic timers perform the same function, that is, they make recordings when no one is around to do it manually. But there are variations in automatic timer operation that you should know about. The first variation involves the way the timer memory stores information. Some store start times and recording lengths. For example, start recording on Monday at 12.30 p.m. and continue recording for two hours. Others store start times and end times. Start recording on Monday at 12.30 p.m. and end recording on Monday at 2.30 p.m. The end result is the same, but some customers might have a preference. Another variation in timer operation is the selection of tuner recording channels. Some timers require the recording channel to be set manually. That is, if more than one timer event is set, the channel must be the same for all events or the channel must be changed manually between timer events. VCRs with clicking tuners or with mechanical button varactor tuners usually work this way. 
Other timer memories can remember a different channel for each timer event. The timer automatically changes channels at the appropriate time. As you might expect, this feature is only available on VCRs with digital PLL tuners or with soft touch Varactor tuners. The third variation in timers is daily and weekly event recording. Basic timer recording is a one-shot procedure. When the selected recording time passes, the timer memory is cleared. But with the daily weekly option, the memory settings are retained and recording repeats until the settings are manually cleared or changed. Finally, all VCRs have a switch or button that is used to put the VCR in the timer mode. Automatic timer recording will not take place unless the timer mode is selected. And to prevent accidental interruption of the timer recording, manual operation is disabled when the timer mode is selected. Quick timer recording, or QTR, is a feature that has only recently been classified as standard. This feature is sometimes called other things, such as one button recording or easy timer recording. With basic or immediate QTR, recording is started manually, but recording stops automatically after a preselected length of time. This type of QTR is handy if you want to begin recording a program while you are at home, but you must leave before the program is over. A second version of this feature, called Delayed QTR, allows setting of a delayed start time within a 24-hour period, in addition to setting the recording length. For programs that start within 24 hours, this feature is quicker than setting the automatic timer. Some VCRs have both types of QTR. Others have only the immediate type. Also, on some VCRs, the QTR times can be set only in 10-minute increments. Other VCRs allow more precise time settings. Antenna cable pass-through is the feature that lets you watch one program while you record another. The antenna or cable signals connected to the VHF UHF terminals of the VCR can go one of two places, either to the tuner, where a specific channel is selected, or directly to the VHF UHF outputs of the VCR. A button, usually called the TV VCR button, controls which signal gets to the VCR output. When the button is set to the TV position, all the antenna cable signals go directly to the VCR output and from there to the TV connected to the VCR. When the button is set to the VCR position, only the single channel selected by the VCR tuner is sent to the VCR output, so the connected TV can only receive that channel. The channel is received by the TV on channel 3 or 4, as determined by the channel 3-4 switch on the VCR. So, whether you are recording or not, setting the TV VCR button to the TV position allows you to select and watch your antenna cable signals as usual. And most VCRs pass through the antenna cable when the VCR is turned off, regardless of the setting of the TV VCR switch. Next is a group of standard features that all relate to movement of the videotape. They are fast forward, rewind, visual search, freeze frame, and record pause. You might think that these features are the same as audio tape deck features, but there are important differences, and we must go inside the VCR to explain them. When a video cassette is first loaded in the VCR, the tape remains inside the cassette. If fast forward or rewind is pressed, the tape moves rapidly in the appropriate direction, but the tape remains inside the cassette. However, when play is pressed, the tape is pulled out of the cassette so that it wraps around the video head drum and passes by the erase head and the audio head. If fast forward or rewind is pressed now, the tape moves rapidly in the appropriate direction, but the tape stays in contact with the video head drum. This creates the fast motion effect we call visual search. The sound is muted during visual search, and the picture contains lines called noise bars. The bars occur because the video heads are not designed to read the video signals at the increased speed. But because this feature is intended only to help locate a section of the tape, perfect picture quality is not really necessary. To understand freeze frame and record pause, you must also understand how the pictures are stored on the tape. 
The signals stored on videotapes are actually a series of individual still pictures that appear to move because they change so rapidly. This is similar to movie film, except you can't see the pictures on videotape because they are stored as electromagnetic signals. At normal playback or recording speed, the picture changes 30 times a second. Each of these 30 pictures is stored on the tape in two parts. The video head drum rotates at 30 times per second and usually has two heads mounted on opposite sides of the drum. The video head on one side of the drum reads one half of the picture and the head on the other side reads the other half. When pause is pressed during playback of the tape, freeze frame occurs. The tape stops at a single picture on the tape and the video heads read that picture over and over again 30 times a second. This appears as a still picture on the TV. As with visual search, noise bars appear during freeze frame because the video heads are designed to read the video information at the normal playback speed. The amount and severity of the noise bars varies from one VCR to another and from one playback speed to another. The freeze frame picture is usually best with tapes made at the slower EP speed. On some VCRs, freeze frame is possible only with tapes made at the EP speed. The screen is blacked out if pause is pressed during the playback of tapes made at the other two speeds. The record pause feature is used to edit out unwanted material as the recording is being made. When pause is pressed during the recording, the VCR backs up the tape a little and stops the tape exactly at the end of a frame. This procedure is called simple backspace edit. Then when pause is pressed again to resume recording, the next frame begins exactly where it should, in sync with the previous frame. Without this feature, there would be a jerk or glitch at the edit point. With it, the edit point is usually smooth and hardly noticed. A counter with memory is another standard VCR feature. The basic counter is used to mark locations on the tape for later reference. To make best use of the counter, always reset it to zero at the beginning of a tape. Then, as the tape plays or records, note the counter reading at any point you might want to locate quickly, the beginning of a program or beginning of an important scene in a movie, for example. As long as the tape is rewound to the beginning and the counter is reset to zero every time the tape is used, the counter readings for those points will be approximately the same. But remember, counter readings may vary from one VCR to another. That is, the counter readings at a particular point on the tape probably won't be the same on two different VCRs. The counter memory offers a second way to return to a specific point on a tape. It is most useful when you must repeatedly return to one point on that tape. When the tape reaches a point you want to return to, reset the counter to zero and press the button or switch that activates the counter memory feature. Then continue recording or playback. When you're ready to return to the zero location, press stop and then rewind. The tape automatically stops when the counter returns to zero. You may record or play back from that point and return to zero as many times as you need to. For optimum playback quality, the tape must be lined up with the video heads exactly the same way it was during recording. The tracking control provides the adjustment that sometimes is necessary to do this. Tracking adjustment is not usually necessary when playing back tapes that were recorded on the playback VCR. The thinner tape used in T160 cassettes can stretch and cause tracking problems after many playbacks. T160 tapes should be avoided. Most tracking problems occur when playing a tape that was not recorded on the playback VCR, a rented tape or a tape made by a friend, for example. Poor tracking shows up as snow in the picture, usually at either the top or bottom. To correct the problem, simply turn the tracking control until the picture is clear. The tracking control has a center detent position. For maximum consistency in recording and playback of your personal tapes, set the control to this position. The erase protection feature prevents accidental erasing of your tapes. When the erase protection tab is broken off of a video cassette, the VCR will not record on the tape. Some VCRs eject such tapes when recording is attempted. This feature is especially important on VCRs with quick timer recording or one button manual recording that make accidental erasure more likely. All pre-recorded rental tapes have erase tabs removed and it's a good idea to remove the tab on any personal tapes that should not be recorded over. 
To record on a tape that has had the erase tab removed, simply cover the hole with a piece of plastic tape. The dew sensor is a standard feature that is seldom activated, but it can prevent one of the most serious problems that can happen to a VCR. Both the videotape and the rotating video head drum has smooth, highly polished surfaces. If water particles, even microscopic ones, form on either surface, the two surfaces can stick together. In severe cases, the tape can wrap around the head drum like fishing line around a cheap fishing reel. If this happens, only a professional repairman can unwind the mess, and it's likely that the heads and other expensive internal components will be damaged. A dew sensor detects excess moisture in the VCR and prevents operation of the VCR until the moisture has been evaporated. Some VCRs have a special indicator to tell you that the dew sensor is preventing operation. On other VCRs, the stop indicator flashes. Moisture problems most often occur when a VCR is brought into a warm house from a cold location, such as the trunk of a car in winter. Naturally, there is condensation on the whole unit, especially the metal head drum. If the unit doesn't work at first, there's no reason for alarm. Simply allow it to warm to room temperature. As an additional safeguard, VCRs have heaters inside the video head drum that are on whenever the VCR is plugged in. Once they've warmed up an hour or two, moisture problems are not likely. We're proud to say that Radio Shack was one of the leaders in the adoption of our final standard feature, the input select switch. In the early years of VCR development, most VCRs were connected to an antenna and to a TV, nothing more. And on those VCRs, the audio-video inputs used automatic switching jacks. When a cable was attached to the jack, the antenna signals were automatically blocked and the AV signals had priority. In fact, the antenna signals were blocked as long as the AV cable was in place, even if there were no AV signals. In those days, this worked fine. The AV jacks were seldom used. When they were used, it was usually a temporary setup to copy a friend's tape. But with the introduction of combination TV monitors, video processors, and two VCR families, this type of jack presented a problem. Most people didn't want to temporarily disconnect the processors or a second VCR every time they wanted to record from a local TV station. The answer was to replace the automatic switching jacks with a separate switch on the front of the VCR. This switch allows manual selection of the VCR input, either from the antenna terminals or the AV jacks. And of course, it is called the input select switch. All Radio Shack VCRs have the input select switch, but our high-end VCRs have a three-way switch instead of the two-way switch we've just described. The three-position switch has the tuner position for antenna signals, the AV or EXT position for separate audio-video signals, and the simul position, which allows you to receive the picture from the antenna cable source and the sound from a separate audio source. You remember how cable companies send separate FM stereo signals through the cable TV wire to carry this stereo sound for the premium channels? Well, the simul position of the input select switch is specially designed for recording such broadcasts. For this type of recording, the output of an FM stereo receiver is connected to the audio inputs of the VCR for the audio source, and the cable channel is selected using the VCR tuner, as usual. Occasionally, local radio and TV stations cooperate for similar simulcasts, and the same type of setup is used to record them. The only problem you might encounter with the input select feature is from people who forget the input select switch is there and forget to set it properly. But for most people, it is an important plus. We mentioned earlier that knowledge of standard features is important to fill in gaps in customer knowledge during the sale. But that might not be the most frequent use of this information. Many customers are so anxious to get home and try their new VCRs that they don't listen carefully to the specifics during the sale. It is likely that many customers will come in or call soon after the sale with some basic questions. Here are three quick examples of things you might hear. Hello, Miss Walters. Are you enjoying your new VCR? Not really. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the problem? Well, I rented my favorite movie, Casablanca, mm -hmm. but the picture has static all along the bottom. Mm, well, that sounds like a tracking problem. Here, let me show you. Now, if you adjust this control from left to right, 
Well, that should clear up the picture. But if it doesn't, just give us a call. Thanks. I knew you'd know the answer. I'm just not comfortable with these things yet. <laughs> they take a little getting used to sometimes. I stopped the VCR to cut out commercials while I'm recording Star Trek episodes on Channel 5. But then when I play back the tape, the picture jumps and rolls for several seconds at each place where I cut out a commercial. What's the matter with your VCRs? Well, that shouldn't happen. Are you pressing pause or stop to stop the recording during commercials? Stop, of course. Okay. When you press stop, the VCR has no way of lining up the last picture before the commercial with the first picture after the commercial. That's what causes the jump. If you were to press pause instead, you'd never know the commercial was there. Okay, I'll try that and let you know. I don't understand it. I did everything just right. The picture on the recording is perfect, but there's nothing but static for sound. Did you watch the program while you were recording? Yes, and the sound was perfect. And what was the setting on the TV VCR switch? TV, I think. Well, since your VCR is so new, I don't think the problem is dirty or worn out heads. And that only leaves one other thing, the input selector switch. Is it possible that you left the switch on simulcast instead of tuner? Oh, no. I did record a special simulcast on the PBS station several days ago. I'm sure that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your help. Sure. No problem. Solving problems like these is not only a good way to build goodwill and customer trust. It is a good time to sell. Often the problem can be best solved with an add-on product. I just bought my second VCR from you, and I'm copying some home movie videotapes that my sister sent. What can I do to make the copy as good as possible? Well, first, be sure that you're using the highest quality tape, such as our Super Tape HG, and make the recording at the fast SP speed. Then, if you really want to get fancy, our video processor is specially designed to help minimize the loss of quality while making copies. I'm not sure about that, but what I'm really concerned about is all the garbage my sister recorded between the sections I want to keep. <laughs> In that case, you want our special effects generator. With that, you can do professional fade-ins and fade-outs, plus a lot more. Can you show me what you mean? Well, sure. Got one set up right here. And the rest is history. That's what we mean when we say knowing what the product does helps you sell the product. Obviously, optional features are the features that are not offered on low-end leader VCRs. But to you, the professional salesmaker, they are also the features that help you sell up first-time VCR customers to middle or top-of-the-line VCRs. And they are the features that make VCR owners want to buy a second unit. These features are easy to display in your store. They are attention getters and can make sales opportunities for you. Are you familiar with Hi-Fi VCR sound? What's that? Well, it's a new sound recording technique used in some VCRs that's comparable to compact discs. As a matter of fact, it's the only home recording system that even comes close to CD quality. Here, let me show you. You get the idea. But before we go any further with that sale, let's talk about all of the special features Radio Shack VCRs have to offer. Stereo sound. Now, you all know what that is, but when talking about VCRs, there are other things to be considered. For example, how is the stereo sound recorded? Is it recorded on the regular linear track, or is it recorded using the new hi-fi technology? To answer these questions, we must once again go inside the VCR. During recording, the tape passes straight across the audio head, so the audio signals are recorded in a straight line on the tape. But because the video head drum is mounted at an angle, the tape crosses the video head at an angle. This mounting angle, along with the rapid spinning of the video head drum, caused the video signals to be recorded in diagonal stripes on the tape. This type of angled recording is called helical scan. And while it is not important for you to understand exactly how helical scan works, you should know that without it, huge reels of two-inch wide videotape would be necessary to record the same amount of material with the same quality as VHS home videos get on a single cassette. On this representation of a piece of videotape, you can see that audio is recorded on a very narrow band along the top edge of the tape. The video signals are recorded in diagonal stripes and cover the rest of the tape. To record regular stereo, this audio track, which is already very narrow, must be split into left and right channels.
These extremely narrow tracks combined with a linear tape speed that is slower than that of standard audio cassettes place a certain limitation on the quality of audio reproduction. Of course, today's advanced audio technology does wonders considering the circumstances, and the regular audio, whether mono or stereo, sounds fine coming out of the small internal speakers of a typical TV. But when the videotape is amplified through a stereo hi-fi system, the limitations become obvious. Wouldn't it be nice if we could use the larger portion of the tape and the advantages of helical scan for audio too? Well, that's exactly what Hi-Fi VCRs do. In Hi-Fi VCRs, there are two audio heads mounted on the rotating head drum in addition to the video heads. And using a process called multiplexing, the audio information is stored on the same part of the tape as the video. You might think that the video and audio signals would interfere with each other, but because the audio signals are stored at different frequencies than the video signals, and because the hi-fi audio heads record signals at a slightly different angle than the video heads, there's no interference. This technology provides home recording quality that is truly comparable to compact discs and surpasses any other home recording system. Now, with all this information fresh in your mind, we're ready to talk about stereo sound as a feature. If a VCR has stereo sound, it is assumed that it is capable of recording and playing back stereo sound only on the linear audio track. You hear the stereo effect when the VCR is connected properly to a stereo TV or stereo system amplifier. However, the frequency and dynamic range are limited and the tape noise level is high compared to that of good cassettes and reel-to-reel -reel tape decks. Most stereo VCRs have Dolby or some other noise reduction system to help reduce the noise. A VCR with hi-fi stereo is able to record and playback audio information using the hi-fi technology we just explained. As with regular stereo, you hear the stereo effect when the VCR is connected properly to a stereo TV or stereo system amplifier, but the frequency response is almost perfectly flat from 20 to 20,000 cycles, and the dynamic range is equal to that of most live performances. Noise reduction is seldom needed for the hi-fi audio system because the signal-to-noise ratio is so good. A hi-fi VCR also records a regular audio track so that tapes recorded on it are compatible with non-hi-fi VCRs. However, the regular track is not always stereo. At first, stereo hi-fi VCRs were designed to record regular stereo tracks too. But because there is so little need for the regular track if you have hi-fi, most hi-fi VCRs now have only mono regular tracks. The mono regular track doesn't present any problem unless you loan a tape to someone who has a regular stereo VCR. Their VCR will only play the regular track in mono. The two VCRs are compatible, but not stereo compatible. We talked generally about MTS tuners in Chapter 1, but you also need some specific information about how MTS tuners and stereo VCRs work together. MTS tuners can receive a main signal in stereo and a secondary signal in mono. Now that's three tracks. What if you want to record the main audio and the secondary audio so that you can choose which one to listen to during playback? Well, our VCRs have a switch that allows different combinations of MTS signal recording. For example, you can record the combined right and left main audio on one stereo channel and the secondary audio on the other channel. Of course, you lose the stereo effect of the main audio, but you do have a choice. How many heads does a VCR have or need? This is a question asked by many prospective VCR buyers. The problem is, there's no simple answer. As you have seen in previous sections of the tape, VCRs have several different types of heads. The erase head, the regular audio head, the video heads, and the hi-fi audio heads. But the video heads are the ones most people are interested in, and these are the only ones most companies advertise. The standard number of video heads is two. The individual pictures or frames of the video signal are recorded in two halves. Each of the video heads records or plays back one half. But if two video heads are capable of recording and playing back the complete video signal, why do some VCRs have more than two heads? 
The extra heads can be used to improve the recording playback quality at the slower EP speed, or the extra heads can be used to improve the picture quality of special effects. But to understand how the extra heads do this, we need to look at the simulated videotape segment again. The angle of the video signals on the tape is affected by the different recording speeds, EP, LP, and SP. In these examples, you can see that the signals recorded at the EP speed are shorter and less angled than those recorded at the SP speed. For optimum performance, a separate pair of heads mounted at the exact angle for each speed would be necessary, but that would be too expensive in most cases. Therefore, on most VCRs, the two video heads are adjusted for a compromise of the different signal angles. The picture quality is very good on these VCRs, especially with the new HQ circuits that we will talk about later. But the adjustment is a compromise and therefore is not the best it can be for any speed. In a four-head VCR that is designed for better picture quality, one pair of heads is adjusted exactly for the angle of the EP speed signals and the other pair for the SP speed signals. There are no compromises and picture quality is improved, especially at the EP speed. This type of four-head adjustment is sometimes called double azimuth. You might have noticed that we have ignored the LP speed. That's because most VCR owners ignore it also. Most people either use SP for the best quality or EP for economy. In a four-head VCR that is designed for better special effects, one pair of video heads is adjusted to a compromise record playback setting, just like a standard two-head VCR. The other two heads are adjusted to read the video signals properly when the tape is stopped, as for freeze frame. In this way, the noise bars you usually see during freeze frame are eliminated or dramatically reduced. This type of four-head VCR is especially important for special effects at the two-hour SP speed. But how does all of this affect your customer? Well, it depends on how they use their VCR. For example, a customer who does nothing but watch rented tapes and who cares nothing about special effects will probably be happy with a standard two-head VCR. All VCRs have a good picture at the SP speed, and almost all rental tapes are the SP speed. However, if that same customer decides he wants to use special effects, the special effects forehead VCR is what he needs. And for the customer who wants to record lots of programs off the air and who wants to save tape and money by using the six hour EP speed, the forehead double azimuth VCR is best. Of course, many customers won't fall neatly into one of these categories. You must be ready with all the information and must help customers make the decision about what is most important to them. Finally, we mentioned earlier that the video heads are the ones that most companies advertise. However, there are a few companies that include the Hi-Fi audio heads, which are mounted in the head drum with the video heads, and their advertised number of heads. Radio Shack will not use this practice. But be sure to tell your customers to watch out for this if they want to shop around. HQ is a feature developed for VHS VCRs that can dramatically improve the video quality of any VCR. However, HQ is not the same in every VCR. So, let's take a look at what HQ really is and how it can vary. There are four circuits that can be used as part of HQ. They can generally be described as increased white level clipping, detail enhancement, noise reduction in the color signal, and noise reduction in the brightness signal. But to display the HQ logo, a VCR only has to have increased white level clipping and any one of the other three circuits. This means there are seven possible combinations of circuits that can qualify a VCR as having HQ. And the only thing that HQ guarantees is that the picture of a particular VCR will be better than it would be without HQ. So if a VCR is poorly designed and constructed to begin with, the picture can still be less than the best. The point we are making is that HQ is a positive feature, but it is not an absolute quality guarantee. Radio Shack VCRs are excellent values and had good picture quality before HQ. The picture quality and the product value are better with HQ. 
But now that you know the basics of HQ, let's talk about the specific circuits, just in case you get a technically curious customer. Increased white level clipping is made possible because of the overall improvement in VCRs and videotapes. When a signal is recorded, the VCR clips off the top of the brightness signal at a point where noise and distortion usually occur. However, because of better tape and VCRs, the point where noise and distortion occur is higher. Therefore, the white clipping level can be increased. The effect of this is sharper edges in the picture, especially around letters. Detail enhancement is simply another circuit that helps sharpen fine lines and edges of objects. Now, the other two circuits are noise reduction circuits, but remember, we're not talking about the kind of noise that you hear. This is noise you see in the form of graininess in the picture. One of the noise reduction circuits takes video noise out of the brightness part of the signal. Technicians call this brightness part of the signal luminance. The other noise reduction circuit removes noise from the color part of the signal. This part of the signal is called chrominance by technicians. Finally, because HQ tapes are 100% compatible with non-HQ VCRs, there's no need for an on-off switch. The feature is always on. On-screen display is the newest optional feature for our VCRs, and there is little to know or understand as far as operation of the VCR is concerned. The VCR has special microprocessors that generate letters and numbers so that things such as clock time, automatic timer settings, and channel settings can be displayed on the TV screen. And you can program the timer using the remote control. On some VCRs, the TV screen is the only place timer information is displayed. On others, the information is also shown on standard digital displays on the VCR. This lets you program the VCR without turning on the TV, if desired. But don't let the simplicity of this feature fool you. Programming the timer has been the most confusing part of VCR operation until now. But on-screen display makes timer programming user-friendly, and your customers will love it. All you have to do is demonstrate. A television is a television is a television. Well, that's the way it was for many years. There was only one type of tuner and one type of picture tube. And the only thing you had to decide was what size you wanted. And even that selection was very limited. And all you could do with a TV was connect it to an outdoor antenna or a pair of rabbit ears and watch the programs that were available from local stations. But as with everything else in video electronics, the TV has gone through many rapid changes in the past few years. Of course, we've already talked about the different types of tuners, cable TV and digital processing in Chapter 1. But there are other developments that are specific to TVs. This chapter contains a description of the different types of TVs, a quick review of the standard TV features, and a detailed discussion of the new optional features. For our purposes, we will divide TVs into four categories, TV receivers, TV monitors, LCD TVs, and projection TVs. As you will see, some TVs fit into more than one of these categories, but if you understand these four categories, you will have no trouble understanding the TVs that are a combination of two or more of the categories. TV receiver is the name for any TV that has a tuner capable of selecting VHF or UHF channels. The name receiver comes from the fact that it can receive radio frequency broadcast signals, separate the audio and video portions of the signals, and turn them into pictures and sound. Remember from chapter one that VHF, UHF, and cable TV signals are all part of a larger signal group called radio frequency. A TV receiver is what all home TVs were for many years and what most people think of as a plain TV set. A monitor often looks about the same as a TV receiver, but it has no internal tuner. It cannot directly receive radio frequency signals. It only has input for separate audio and video signals. These signals are available from separate external tuners, VCRs, satellite receivers, and other video components. 
Until recently, monitors were only available to and used by professional TV studios. But the recent video boom has seen the introduction of many video components and accessories that also use the separate AV signals. To use these new components, people needed a TV that could use the separate audio and video signals, but they still wanted to be able to receive antenna or cable signals. This need resulted in the combination TV receiver monitor. All of the units that Radio Shack sells as TV monitors are actually this type of combination with antenna cable inputs and separate AV inputs. LCD TVs are different from other TVs mainly because of the type of screen they have. Most TVs use a picture tube that is technically called the cathode ray tube or CRT. In this type of picture tube, an electronic beam controlled by electromagnets draws the picture on the front surface of the tube 30 times every second. But the picture tube in an LCD isn't a tube at all. It is a liquid crystal display, much like the ones used in some digital watches and clocks. The display is made up of thousands of tiny dots called pixels. The video signal is converted to digital information by the TV. Then a microprocessor tells each pixel whether it should be black, white, or somewhere in between for each frame of the video signal. And it does this several times a second. LCD TV screens are very new, and they will certainly improve in the future, but they already offer some specific advantages in small screen TVs. First, this LCD screen is a flat wafer-like unit, which makes it possible for LCD TVs to be more compact than small TVs with a standard picture tube. Second, the screen is designed so that existing light sources, the sun or normal room lights, can be used to light the picture. This means the TV uses less power. Finally, the picture on an LCD screen is not washed out by strong sunlight. In fact, the picture gets better in stronger light. Of course, regular TV screens react just the opposite in strong light. There are a couple of minor disadvantages with LCD TVs. First, the screen must have some type of light source. As we've already said, this can be sunlight or room lights. But most LCD TVs come with a separate light, either internal or external, that has to be used to watch the TV in low light or darkness. And of course, this uses a little more power. Second, the picture scan rate is less than the normal 30 per second. This can cause a slight smearing of the picture in fast action scenes. However, LCD technology is improving rapidly, and this problem is sure to be solved soon. At this time, all LCD TVs are small and therefore portable. The features are the same for any small portable TV. And so far, all LCD TVs can be classified as TV receivers because they all have built-in tuners that allow channel selection. But someday, there might be a large, flat LCD monitor that hangs on the wall like a large painting. The tuner could be hidden away somewhere and operated by remote control. Projection TVs are large screen units you often see in commercial establishments. The diagonal measurement of these screens is typically 40 inches or more. But the screen itself is not producing the picture. The picture is projected onto a blank screen similar to those used in movie films. There are models that project the picture from the front and others that use a translucent screen and project the picture from the back. In either case, there are two popular methods used to project the picture. In one, the picture of a smaller TV set is projected onto the screen. In the other, a three-lens color projector is used to project the picture directly onto the screen. A projection TV can be either a TV receiver with an internal tuner, a TV monitor that only accepts AV inputs, or a combination unit. Because of the extremely limited market for this type of TV, Radio Shack does not plan to enter the market. But it doesn't hurt for you to know at least a little about them so that you can talk more intelligently to customers about their options. Everybody knows how to use a regular TV, or do they? Yes, there are probably few, if any, people that do not know how to turn on a TV and select a channel.
But you might be surprised how many people know little else about the everyday operation of a TV. For example, what's the difference between tent and hue? What's the difference between contrast and brightness? Why don't all TVs have fine-tuning controls and horizontal and vertical hold controls? Do you know the answers to these questions? Do your customers? Well, the following information about standard features answers these questions and more. We talked about the three types of tuners in Chapter 1, but we didn't mention fine-tuning or why it is sometimes necessary. TV stations use sophisticated equipment to make sure their transmitting frequencies remain constant, so fine-tuning problems are seldom caused by the stations. But some tuners use temperature-sensitive components, so the reception can vary with temperature. A fine-tuning control allows manual adjustment for such variations. However, most tuners now contain a circuit called AFT, which stands for Automatic Fine Tuning. This circuit adjusts the tuner as long as the tuner is reasonably close to the right frequency. So, in most cases, AFT eliminates the need for fine-tuning controls. Digital PLL tuners use crystal-controlled circuits, similar to those used by TV stations, to maintain the accuracy of the tuner. A fine-tuning control is never needed for this type of tuner. However, because all cable channels are not the same, digital tuners usually have either AFT or a switch that allows the tuner to receive the different variations of cable channels. To the customers, fine-tuning is unlike most other features because high-end TVs are less likely to have it. Most TVs have a brightness control, and some also have a contrast control. Often, people think these controls do the same thing, but they don't. The brightness control makes the entire picture either darker or lighter. The contrast control increases or decreases the difference in the brightness between the dark areas and the light areas of the picture. Vertical and horizontal hold controls correct the picture problems known as vertical roll and horizontal tear. But these controls are similar to fine-tuning because better TVs have circuits that make the adjustment automatically. There are two additional controls included on most color TVs. One of these is usually called color, but might also be called intensity. The other might be called tint or hue. All of the colors in the TV picture are made from different combinations of three basic colors, red, green, and blue. The color control adjusts the overall amount of color in the picture by increasing or decreasing all three colors equally. The tint control adjusts the balance among the three colors so that they are mixed in the proper amounts to reproduce the picture accurately. Some TVs have automatic adjustment of color and tint, but manual controls are also needed to allow for personal taste. Antenna connections are the final standard feature in our list. All TVs must be able to receive VHF channels 2 through 13 and UHF channels 14 through 69. Most TVs still receive UHF channels up to 83, but the FCC requirement has recently been lowered to 69 because no more TV stations will be licensed for channels above 69. And most TVs have separate UHF and VHF antenna terminals. The UHF terminals are always 300 ohm, and the VHF terminals might be 300 or 75 ohm. But why are these separate? Most people use combination antennas and have to use a special splitter to connect the signals to the TV. Well, the reason for the separate terminals goes back many years. Early TVs only received VHF. Then when UHF channels were added, the manufacturers simply added a separate UHF tuner inside the TVs. And, of course, it had separate input terminals. But today, most TVs use a combined UHF-VHF tuner. The separate antenna terminals remain only because people are used to them. The two separate inputs are actually combined inside the TV before they go to the tuner. It would be easier and less expensive to have a single antenna terminal on the TV and VCR. And some manufacturers have already started doing this. Radio Shack plans to do this in the very near future. It will be more convenient for the vast majority of people and for the few people who use separate VHF and UHF antennas. We already sell an antenna combiner. 
As with information about standard VCR features, you are more likely to use information about standard TV features when answering questions about customers' problems. But, as we said before, customer problems are usually sales opportunities in disguise. When I change channels, it takes a second or two for the picture on the new channel to come in clearly. Am I doing something wrong? I don't think so. It sounds like the automatic fine-tuning is having to search for a few seconds before it finds the new channel. If your TV has a fine-tuned control, well, you can adjust it to minimize or eliminate the search time. It doesn't have one. I've had that TV for several years, and it's never really worked the way I think it should. Well, TVs with digital tuners should never have that problem. Here, let me show you. Many of the new and optional TV features, such as cable-ready tuners, MTS decoders, and digital processing, have already been discussed in Chapter 1. But there are other important features you should know about. Controls called sharpness or picture are often included in high-end TVs or combination receiver monitors. The sharpness control is actually a detail enhancer, similar to the ones in separate video processors. And the picture control is a sophisticated contrast control. Most high-end TVs and receiver monitors have circuits called comb filters that remove video noise from the signal and therefore make the picture sharper. These circuits have no external control and are always on. The customer might be unaware of them unless you explain them. But they do make a positive difference in the picture quality. A high-resolution picture tube is a very important optional feature, but many people don't understand exactly what it is. The picture resolution is measured in the number of lines that are used to make the picture. There are vertical lines, which are the number of lines from top to bottom, and horizontal lines, which are the number of lines from side to side. All TV signals broadcast in the United States have 525 lines of vertical resolution. This is the national standard and cannot be changed. And although there are some TVs called high definition that process the signal and artificially create more lines, the number of actual lines is always 525. However, the number of horizontal lines is controlled by the TV. 250 lines is about average, and any number greater than about 300 is considered to be high resolution. The number can be much higher. The greater the number of horizontal lines, the sharper the picture. This is especially important for larger screen TVs or for TVs that are used as computer monitors. If you use a word processor to display more than 40 letters per line on a screen that is not high resolution, it's very hard, if not impossible, to read. Specialized computer monitors are best for sophisticated word processor programs. A high contrast screen is a relatively new feature. It uses a dark or tinted CRT to improve the picture contrast, particularly in brightly lighted rooms. Because customer research tells us that high contrast levels are seen by customers as an important element of picture quality, this new feature should be very popular. Displays of sets with high contrast screens in stores with outside windows where normal screens often look washed out due to high light levels will be particularly effective. The square picture tube is a new feature that is advertised to improve picture quality, and it does in laboratory measurements. Until recently, all picture tubes have been slightly rounded at the corners. This results in a small amount of picture distortion at the corners. Although it is a measurable improvement, it's questionable whether the customer will get enough visible benefit to justify the added cost. Radio Shack builds products for real customer value, not advertising advantage. Another point is that when the corners are squared, the diagonal measure increases. So a set comparable to a 19-inch Radio Shack set is built as a 20-inch set with square corners. Although the diagonal measurement is larger, the increase in overall picture area is negligible in terms of real customer value. Multiple RF inputs are an especially nice feature if you have cable TV but want to receive local stereo broadcasts. Remember, the local stereo signals are often not passed on by the cable company. So with this feature, you can permanently connect both the antenna wire and the cable wire to the TV. Then usually by remote control, you can choose the signal source you want. 
Combination receiver monitors might also have multiple audio video inputs for connection of more than one VCR or other component that uses audio video signals. Some of these features are easy to demonstrate to customers. Others are difficult to demonstrate but can be easily explained. In either case, the final reason our customers pick our TVs over someone else's might be the fact that you know what you're talking about and that you take the time to tell the customers what these special features can mean to them.